Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my presentation, Low-Cost Precision Farming and Public Health Swiss Mitigation. The presentation is looking on space and health from a holistic angle. The driving force is public health risk mitigation. And if we bridge the gap between public health, one health, and space technology, the question is how can we leverage the potential of space technology for public health risk mitigation? If we use the metaphor of a bridge, then moving from space to health over a bridge which has missing links in between creates a problem because you have perfect bridge parts before and after the missing link but you will not reach the other end of the bridge because you have missing parts in between. So the holistic view on the problem solving tries to keep an eye on missing limbs from space to health. So we look on chronic kidney disease in the health domain which is a progressive loss of renal function over a period of time, month or year. Normally it's associated with high blood pressure and diabetes. For this presentation we have to distinguish between the common chronic kidney disease and the chronic kidney disease from non-traditional causes. The common chronic kidney disease is normally developed in older age and it's uh, females and males do, do get it. But chronic kidney disease of non-traditional causes is mainly associated with heavy labor in hot temperature, especially among industrials and agricultural workers, and it's appearing in the male population. Our main focus for this presentation will be the agricultural workers, in particular those that work in the sugarcane production. From the medical perspective, the only treatment for the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology is dialysis or kidney transplant. But this treatments, medical treatments, was extremely expensive and uh, mostly unavailable for thousands of people suffering from the disease. Because the agricultural workers do not suffer from the ca classical causes of uh, chronic kidney disease like obesity or high blood, blood pressure, the only options uh, for risk mitigation is reducing at least some factors of nephrotoxic impact on the kidneys. If we look for viable options to reduce the nephrotoxic impact on agricultural workers, we go further to apply a low-cost precision farming in the agricultural setting. If we look on that agriculture and the exposure of campesinos or farm workers with toxicants, agrochemicals is one aspect to look at. Precision farming tries to use agrochemicals according to the geolocation of the plants. Different areas might need different amounts of pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers. Satellite images can detect the reflectance of the crop in the red and the near infrared um, bandwidth and the NDVI, the normalized difference vegetation index, indicates the crop health. The NDVI can be calculated in uh, open source geoinformation systems like RAS. You find tutorials for that on YouTube. Space technology is involved on two levels. The first is the remote sensing level to create the NDVI maps to detect the crop health. The second application of space technology is the navigation. GPS devices mounted in the cabin of a, a machine allow to minimize the amount of overlapping areas of spraying fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides. Furthermore, the application rate can be automatically tailored by the GPS uh, navigation system so that the geolocation uh, for the crop get the uh, optimized dose of agrochemicals. For low-cost precision farming we have to distinguish between the mechanized application of agrochemicals and the application of farm workers going through the, for example, sugarcane field with pump sprayer. You can imagine that application with a tractor and a protected farm work in the cabin 
uh, has less exposure to agrochemicals than a campesino working through the sugarcane field with a pump sprayer. For low-cost precision farming, the minimal technical equipment is the mobile de device as a decision support client. Um, currently available smartphones can be used for low-cost precision farming in terms of uh, determining the geolocation and the application rate for the agrochemical at this, ge this geolocation. Risk mitigation has to be implemented in a wider scope of public health uh, objectives including food security, minimize exposure to agrochemicals for the farm workers and environment and also the workflow optimization and self-protection of the worker. The special patterns of application of agrochemicals help the, the farm owners to minimize the application of agrochemicals by keeping the same amount of harvest yield and this combines an economic benefit of an optimized farming with low-tech environment also for developing countries. The support of uh, countries in Central America and Latin America for for applying precision farming also in a low-tech environment could be a possible or viable option to reduce the amount of used agrochemicals in agriculture. How could such an application could look like? If we look on the on the display for the low-cost precision farming approach, the GPS location is coming from the GPS sensor on of the smartphone. To the GPS location there is an icon, an abstract and a URL attached. It says apply agrochemical X, X rate Y in this area so you at least know the application rate. So you see a small icon, so an arrow where to, to go for the application and the abstract apply agrochemical X at rate Y and if you click on the small abstract apply agrochemical you get more information this information is linked to the URL maybe a wiki multimedia content the multimedia con content could show in a small video how to apply the spray pump in that area to achieve this agrochemical uh, rate for this uh, for, for the sugarcane field furthermore um, the URL could contain additional information for the public health workers in that area to support uh, public health risk mitigation. This shows a generic principle of attaching digital information to a geolocation. This enables the possibility to deliver information tailored to the user profile and the geolocation of the user. For example, if you have a vector control unit the display of the smartphone can display where to use uh, the larvae sites for the vector control. If you have public health workers for chronic kidney disease, you can show images of uh, skin manifestations of chronic kidney disease so that public health workers can identify the disease on the skin on workers in agriculture. The risk is delivered through a GIS risk mapping server to the smartphone and via offline usage the risk information tailored to the area can be stored on the SD card of a smartphone so that you have local access to the knowledge even if you, if you don't have internet connectivity. In some areas we don't have internet connectivity so we have to focus also on the problem of offline usage of maps or the NDVI for low-cost precision farming. How does this work with mobile devices? When you are online with your mobile device you can select an area of the map with a map selector and you select the area by and download it on the mobile device. So when downloading is finished the mobile device is ready for offline usage. The offline usage is just mentioned the detailed application of agrochemicals but it could also, uh, also help the vector control units to apply the correct dose of larvae sites that has minimal impact on the environment and maximal impact on the vector control. Furthermore, if data is collected during the offline usage it can be returned 
to a stored collection in, in the GIS servers when the mobile device is online again. How a map selector works can be seen with the free open source navigation system Navit. In collaboration with OpenStreetMap, you select a certain area for the navigation system, download it and use it on your smartphone or mobile device. OpenStreetMap is kind of Wikipedia for maps. You can edit it, improve the, the maps, add more features, point of interest like healthcare facilities, so that other users can download the map, use that for their own purpose and use it on their smartphone also offline. As mentioned before, offline usage is fundamental for areas where you don't have internet connectivity and so commercial map services, even if they have free access to the maps online, they are not appropriate for usage in, in an offline mode because you don't have the right to download the maps for offline usage. If we look on the risk and response cycle, the, the mobile device has the GPS location, it goes to the risk map and the risk map is evaluated at the geolocation and provides the risk at the geolocation back to the mobile device, online or offline, depending on the downloaded map. So the GPS device is able to present my own risk at the geolocation. Nevertheless, we have to consider the last mile problem. Even if mobile devices, cell phones are widely spread in, in developing countries, it's not necessarily the case that the risk exposed people own a mobile device. So we have to consider the last mile problem that risk mitigation and risk awareness is reaching also the people that do not own the uh, mobile device. So social workers, public health workers can be the intermediate step between the IT path and the last mile to the risk exposed people. This concept is again generic. Mobile devices do not have sensors or a measurement instrument to detect contamination of water, contamination of fruit and vegetables in that area, radioactive uh, radiation or epidemiological risk at the GPS location. So this altogether combine a type of invisible risk in that area but uh, the mobile device is not able to to detect the data, the risk on its own because the the sensors are not available, so this is called GPS pseudo-measurement. The risk information coming originally from a risk mapping server determined by public health agencies or, or other go governmental organizations. Now we summarize what we have so far. We have to compare the uh, low-cost precision farming approach with approaches uh, known from landscape epidemiology. In the following slide you see how remote sensing and response to remote sensing is integrated in a risk and response cycle. The cycle consists of two main pillars, the diagnosis support to identify the risk and activate response in the health system according to the risk mapping uh, done before. The classical of approach of using remote sensing is to de detect uh, the temporal spatial risk according to environmental conditions that trigger a vector, for example, a mosquito. In this case, the remote sensing part is mainly in the risk area. When we consider chronic kidney disease, the remote sensing is located more on the right side in the response area because the response is, is using remote sensing for the NDVI, the greenest le level of the crop or the crop health, and tailor the pesticide applications and minimize the total amount of used pesticides and contribute in the long run to less exposure to toxicants in the working environment of the farm workers. But both approaches, one, for example, vector disease control for mosquitoes or the low-cost precision farming approach have something in common. It is the role of smartphones in the low-cost environment. Smartphones can use for collecting ground data, submitted to a geographic information system, 
and on the other hand in the response part deliver information tailored to the geolocation and the user profile it means disease control and individualized health risk or images on the skin manifestation of chronic kidney disease to support public health workers in identifying the disease in the rural area. The basic idea of One Health is combining environmental health and public health in the unified concept of health. A healthy society can be accomplished if and only if if we have a healthy environment. So the response I mentioned before is, is targeting the environmental risk of uh, exposure to toxicants or agrochemicals for the farm workers. We talked about the spatial patterns of risk in a geographic information system for our example quantum gris or grass and we didn't mention the decision support both together geographic information system and decision support system equals a spatial decision support system so the decision support in this case is where to apply the, the pesticide to at what amount but this is only part of the problem solving strategy the problem solving strategy needs kind of self-assessment framework, workflow optimization for the farm workers so that they can do their work but with less negative impact on their health. When you look on WHO self-assessment framework, for example, clean hands, safe lives, then you see the self-assessment framework is complemented with risk mitigation strategies. If you identify a certain risk in your area or in your uh, healthcare facility, then you have options for mitigating the risk. So if we think in that terminology, the spatial patterns of risk are one part of the medal. The other part of the medal is how can we support people tailored to the geolocation of with support material for workflow optimization and for risk areas and support people in mitigating their own risk in their everyday work. Going back to the metaphor of a bridge from the very beginning, this means we need educational programs in school to create risk awareness from the very beginning of education and this includes necessary support material, learning environments that are appropriate for that region, that integrate regional facilities and regional agricultural habits into the educational program. Rural communities are different from area to area. They have different requirements and different constraints. This implies that also capacity building material or risk mitigation material must be adapted from one area to another. As mentioned before, the GIS and the GPS location on a smartphone allows us to deploy information tailored to the geolocation of the user. Material that is adaptable from one area to another, it needs some licensing model that allows the adaptation of material for a certain purpose without licensing costs. An open community approach is generic in many senses for open source software and open content for free uh, deployment to the rural areas and uptake of the material and tailor it for the individual needs. Open community by definition means it's a generalization of the concept of open source to other collaborative effort. The term open for an open community refers to the opportunity for anyone to join and contribute the collaborative effort. The direction and goals are determined collaboratively by all members of the community. The resulting work is made available under a free license so that other communities can adapt and build on them. In this context, the product is an open community to improve public health by application of space technology. So what are examples for open content? Images of skin manifestations or of renal failure would be available for capacity building and risk awareness. Other options are videos for applying the spray pump or mixing agrochemicals so that the 
Exposure to agrochemicals is minimized for the farm workers, the families. Time to apply the agrochemicals so that have, they have a maximum impact uh, for the crop health. There are capacity building material that helps in the long run to reduce the, no the amount of agrochemicals and the second objective having an impact on the renal function of the farm workers. How does the open community work for the chronic kidney disease? First of all, we need to calculate the MDVI for low-cost precision farming. For example, there is also a tutorial for calculating the MDVI for grass. And the people in that area want to use quantum GIS for the calculation of the MDVI. So there is a little bit of workload to do to adapt the given tutorial, video tutorial for calculating the NDVI to quantum GIS. And so there's additional workload and then you deliver the result to the community. The next usage is 100% open and free, so you can use the quantum GIS, which is open source software, and you can use the quantum GIS tutorial for calculating the NDVI. So this is 100% free. So when you use that again, there might be additional calculations to be done, a connectivity to a smartphone, a connectivity to, to an application that uses the risk map and the resource map for low cross precision farming. So somebody takes an open source application for Android smartphones and this needs an adaptation of 15% workload and he takes already existing smartphone software just by 15% workload for the application for the smartphones. So we have the smartphone developed. So maybe that is developed for, for the Spanish language. And so all the Spanish speaking Latin American countries can use this smartphone application for low cross precision farming. But maybe in Malaysia, or Sri Lanka there, we found also a chronic kidney disease epidemic, which is also associated to uh, agriculture. And so it, the, the smartphone Androids needs adaptation, the language adaptation to Sri Lanka. So there's additional workload of 5% to be done to adapt the whole software and then deploy it again to the Sri Lankan community and use that again for public health risk mitigation. This whole concept shows how capacity building material software can be used, improved and donated back to the community and build on that and build better software, better tutorials and open content for public health risk mitigation. To understand a little bit better what is the ratio between the open usage in an open source community. I listed here an 11 hour statistical data from the 16th January of 2012 that shows there's 4.4 million downloads, which is equivalent to open usage, download, use it, and 4,000 code commits, that is a code improvement, and 4,000 forum posts are submitted. So this is equivalent to the discussion about the future development of the software and 450 bucks are tracked. So which is 0.01% of um, the whole open usage of error report. So if you look at the numbers, then you see that one so only a small fraction of donation of labor force to the open source community and the most is free access to the software for their different purposes they want to apply it. Transferring that to the health community, if we have open source software available in the context of public health risk mitigation, then reduce the total cost of ownership for application of risk mitigation strategies. Of course, open source and open content together are just a fraction of the total cost of ownership, but at least it reduces the cost uh, for software and content. Furthermore, it is always necessary to adapt content material to the local requirements and constraints, and so it is important to have something available which uh, includes a license of adaptation 
and modification and donate back to the community. So nevertheless, this necessary requirement for adaptation is included in open content licenses like Creative Commons or the open source license which for uh, GRASS and uh, Open Data Kit and so on. Just look on a simple example of adaptation of open content resources. For example, the manifestation of chronic kidney disease on the skin can be documented by photos. But if you transfer this photos as capacity building material from Latin America to South Africa because of the different skin color and skin, skin type, the uh, chronic kidney disease is, looks different on, on different skins. So the principle of showing images on uh, the manifestation of chronic kidney disease is equivalent in Latin America and South Africa. But the, uh, the images that show the, that are used for capacity building material have to be replaced and ad adapted to the local requirement, requirement and constraints. So what we have seen so far is that we started from space technology, but doing public health risk mitigation needs experts from different angles uh, that, that look from different angles on the problem solving strategies. So all the different disciplines provide uh, their tools for, for risk mitigation and the living lab combines all these tools and tries to select the best options for a certain rural area in which the uh, farm workers are suffering from chronic kidney disease. So who can be uh, integrated in a living lab? Local administration, so that the administration looks on processes from the administrative point of view, the farm owners, because they are key decision makers in what pesticides are applied, in which form do they uh, apply the, the pesticides in the sugarcane field. We need logistics experts that look on the workflow management uh, for, the, for the farm workers, so the workflow optimization could lead to less exposure to pesticides uh, in the workflow and also to use um, logistics optimization in the way that uh, spray drift is minimized to, the, to humans. Public health experts look on, this, on the subject from, from their public health background. It's an epidemic in Latin America and India and Sri Lanka. And so what are response options from the health system to reduce the risk? Um, the public health agency can look on the problem for risk mitigation, risk awareness in television, radio and newspapers or via smartphones and public health workers. They select risk mitigation strategies for public awareness measures and so on. Medical experts look on the monitoring of the farm workers, look how their kidney filter capacity is changing over time, is there an impact of the risk mitigation strategies in that area and the farm workers itself are an important participant in the living lab. It says living labs are uh, prototypes of user-driven innovation. So from outside it makes sense just to pull over a protection suit but then you asked why don't know the farm workers do it because it's so hard work and if you wear that protection suit then it increases the dehydration of the body and so it worsens in some cases the situation for the kidneys because you lose so much water because of the uh, tropical heat and the hard labor work they have to do. So sometimes an easy risk reduction mechanism does not work in rural areas because we do not know the local requirements and constraints. So while farm workers know the local working conditions, what can be done, what not can be done, so they are key Key, um, key partners in the user-driven innovation process. The secondly, we need ICT expert. As you mentioned, there is the an ICT link uh, up to the last mile where uh, digital information can be processed, uh, deployed to the end user so that the end user is aware of the risk, can use risk mitigation uh, resources or is just aware of risk mitigation measures just deployed from the public health agency. So the ICT part in that 
whole information processing chain for data collection um, has to be considered and it's part of the whole problem solving strategies. So the next step will be just to implement a living lab in El Salvador for uh, realizing a first prototype of living lab for public health risk mitigation. Space technology provides a tool, but it's, it's uh, one, of, uh, to, one of other tools that support risk mitigation. And finally, the local communities have to decide what are the best options for risk mitigations, where is the best compliance to the risk mitigation strategies. The best strategy will not have any impact on risk mitigation if the people in that area do not apply the risk mitigation strategies. In South Africa, a big network of living labs was established in Southern Africa. It's called LISA. This network uh, provides successful and sustainable living labs in rural areas. So the successfulness and the sustainability of these living labs um, show that the concept will work in rural areas. So it makes sense to transfer the knowledge of living labs for application of risk mitigation strategies to the chronic kidney disease problem. In the beginning, we discussed the concept of bridging the gap between spales and health. Classical concept of landscape epidemiology looks on environmental factors that determine a vector. In this case, we considered low-cost precision farming as a response option to chronic kidney disease. The GPS tailored decision support system helps to provide tailored information to the geolocation and the space technology, on the other hand, with remote sensing, support us in a way to provide a crop health map. The crop health map helps us to um, deploy and allocate the uh, rates locally for sugarcane fields so that the objective is to reduce the amount of agrochemicals in the long run and uh, achieve the same harvest yield for the, for the farm owners. So the combination of economic benefit and public health benefit was the key element for a success. So if economic interest and um, public health interests are pulling from the different angles, then uh, you can imagine that it's the success of a public health story uh, is sometimes determined by the economic constraints and requirements and so difficult to realize that. In this case, we have an economic benefit and a public health benefit if we apply the space technology for low-cost precision farming. Of course, there is a step to do because uh, precision farming is applied, applied on big tractors in agro-industry, but it's not usual to use it in low-cost precision farming. So with just a smartphone that determines the application rate in a certain area. And we need, of course, uh, workflow support, which is a core element to optimize the situation and the working labor conditions for the farm workers. Of course, there are missing gaps in between. The low-cost app for precision farming is still necessary to develop it. We have a GIS, an open source, Quantum GIS, Grass, Saga. There are many options available. We don't have capacity material for all this open source geographic information system. We have a space agencies available in different countries that can support the low-cost precision farming process with uh, satellite images. And the processing through geographic information system is okay so far. Then we have this missing gap for low-cost precision farming app for smartphones. The workflow optimization, there's still a lot of things to do and they are different in different areas in Latin America. And the living lab approach is just in the very beginning. So we start that in El Salvador very soon and then derive decision support options for the health system and of course the last brick, the last mile. We can go with ICT a long way but the, sometimes if we don't reach the people exposed to the public health or one health risk then we reach nothing in that environment. So we have to build the, to the whole bridge so that People that suffer from that disease have at least some impact on their health situation in the long run. 
Last but not least, I want to thank um, many organizations that contributed to the open community approach. First of all, the Office of Outer Space Affairs of the UN OSA with the program of space application, um, especially Sergei Chernikov, the uh, Health Ministry of El Salvador, the ENS, who organized the regional meeting point in El Salvador, the public health agency who chaired the Action Team 6 for many years with a lot of improvement on space and health. And also running the follow-up initiative of Action Team 6 for now two and a half years. And uh, the public health agency in Canada contributed also with many ideas on improvement of the Action Team 6 scenario. The Ashita Menon Center of Health Science and Studies in India contributed to the early warning and response system on communicable diseases. The CSII in Pretoria, under the guidance of uh, Marlene Herselmann, uh, contributed to living labs in uh, to apply that for chronic kidney disease or public health settings and the University of Koblenz Landau I want to thank them for supporting the um, the expert meeting at the UN campus in Bonn and the upcoming IT orga for the virtual meetings uh, personally it's really amazing how people contribute their labor force their expertise and their knowledge to an open community approach for a common good. For me personally, it's really a contribution to the core idea of United Nations to work together for a mutual benefit for our member states. Thank you for watching this video and I'm open for questions in the upcoming video conference. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide this presentation to you in Argentina.